this conversation is near and dear to my heart and you know all of you are are leaders with influence in your respective workplaces so it's an incredible opportunity for me to share what I've been learning and and why it matters um, and I'm going to make sure there's some time as well for questions but also if you want to stop me or drop something into the chat feel free to do so I like to keep it very conversational but I'll kind of start with the story behind my bio the part that's not there um, and why I started mom's hierarchy of needs which led me to launch uh, the allies at work program where I now work with employers and, and that started last year but I completely burned out after my second child was born I mean at the time it was really awful now it feels like a gift in the sense that with people burning out at in a massive scale through the pandemic. Um, I've been through that journey and kind of crawled my way out and can share a lot of what I've learned. Um, but at the time, you know, I had come back to work after maternity leave. I had taken on a pretty large promotion prior to going out on maternity leave and everything changed in my organization. I had moved from managing one large department to managing two large departments. Our organization um, shifted strategy. They decided to kind of move from focusing on top line revenue growth to becoming more profitable as a business. I had a, a team that I didn't get to know very well before I went out on maternity leave and shortly after coming back, nearly half of the people on one of my teams all had to go out on FMLA leave suddenly for completely different reasons. It was just completely random. And so I found myself really in a new job where under normal circumstances, I needed to bring my most clear, sharp, strategic thinking to solve completely different problems than what I was solving before I went out on leave. But I was exhausted. I was depleted. I had a newborn. I was sleeping in one hour increments. I also had a toddler and, you know, there were days that I would drive out to the office. It was almost an hour away and I just wouldn't even remember how I got there. Um, I felt like a tired, crazy zombie person and I couldn't figure out what other people were doing, um, what other mothers were doing, what other parents were doing to make it work. And I would find myself many nights, like kind of typing away on my computer, trying to you know, shield the co-sleeper with a pillow so that the glow wouldn't wake up my daughter. And, you know, this is kind of common in our culture, but at the time I felt like, wow, you know, things are falling apart. I have all of these new strat you know, strategic challenges at work. I'm exhausted, I'm depleted. So the answer must be, to just work harder. <laughs> and so I found myself, you know, working till one, two, three in the morning. I was working at all hours and it became unsustainable. A job that I'd absolutely loved for, you know, quite a while became a job that I couldn't find myself in anymore. So I had to change. I went to a much larger company. I took a huge pay cut. Instead of managing two large departments, I was managing one direct report and I negotiated a four day work week and it still took over two years to recover from burnout and begin to feel like myself again and feel like I could string sentences together again. And a lot of people go through this. And I think what's interesting now in hindsight, could I have spoken to my employer about this? Could I have talked to my boss about this? Um, and I could have. But at the time, you know, when you first come back from being out on leave, um, and if it's a leave, you know, for a new child, it's a really vulnerable time. You know, you want to prove yourself in your career. You want to prove that you still have all of the attributes that made you a rock star in your career before you went out on leave. And I was in an incredibly fast-paced organization and it just didn't feel like they would be willing to slow down um, or adjust or change my schedule or do any of the things that could have made an incredible difference to me at the time. 
And it was the first point in my life where people who didn't know me would approach me and tell me that I looked terrible and asked me what was wrong. So it was, you know, it was really written all over my face um, that I just was, I had become unhealthy and exhausted. So when I started Mom's Hierarchy of Needs, um, it was after a very casual conversation with a startup founder who happened to be a dad. He was at the time starting a mental health startup, which I ended up doing some advisory work for, for a couple of years. So I did a a fair amount of research into drivers of stress and anxiety and um, in context with this business. And he said, well, why are moms so stressed? And I'm like, well, how much time do you have? (laughs) And I said, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then there's mom's hierarchy of needs. And something about it really clicked for me. And I began researching this intersection between stress, self-care, and growth, and really wanting to understand what was making it so hard to make space for mental, physical, and emotional well-being, um, and what was so hard internally, why I wasn't giving myself permission to do it, and also externally, what were the systems and structures, the way we work, the culture of work, our society, um, the way we're supported in the workplace. And so all of those things have kind of been at the heart of my research now for just over five years. My youngest is in Zoom kindergarten now. Um, And by starting with mothers who are, you know, the least represented in leadership, have very limited discretionary time, and who are, you know, I think, an amazing group to really look at when you examine what needs to change in the workplace, because I've told everyone who will listen to me that if you change work so that it can actually work for mothers, then work is better for everyone. Then it's great for that 25 year old guy who has a dog and wants to surf during the day, right? It's a more flexible, welcoming environment when you can actually take your life and bring everything about who you are into the workplace and work fits around your life versus the other way around, which I think is you know the culture that we've all been in. So that's the backstory. We'll dive into some of the data. I started, um, and we'll go to the next slide. I started researching the pandemic March 30th of last year. I was incredibly curious about how, and at the time I thought it would be like, oh, you know, I'll study this for a few weeks. <laughs> Little did I know um, that I'm now over 2,000 parents have participated in the study, and it has been, you know, 14 months of running this study. So it's been really interesting to see how it's been trending and changing over time. But in the beginning, what happened was that parents really leaned very heavily into their parenting roles. And most people at the beginning of my study, which was wave one, felt like they were doing as well or better than they were as parents. Um, Most people did not feel good about their performance at work. You know, they were overwhelmingly, you know, probably 60% felt like they were doing not as well as usual or terribly at work, but they felt proud of their parenting. They felt proud of their ability to pivot and adjust to this incredible disruption. And during what is, you know, I think unquestionably the most like mass uh, period of fear that we've had, um, you know, in our lifetimes. So all of those things had kind of happened in the beginning. um, But in the most recent wave of the study, for lots of different reasons, kids going back to school, parents seeing how their children's um, report cards and how their performance academically has been, a lot of kids are not doing well mentally. Um, A lot of kids were receiving support like behavioral health services through the schools, which have been reduced through COVID. People are also needing to return to work in more communities or return to office physically in more communities, even though they don't have childcare or their onsite school has been disrupted. In many communities, it's still some odd mishmash of hybrid, or if it is full-time, every time there's a COVID exposure, in a school or a daycare, or even if someone has a private caregiver, that means that they're gonna lose their childcare for like 14 days at a time. 
um, which is perhaps the question that I receive the most when I'm doing talks for employee groups and I'm speaking with parents, you know, someone will kind of raise their hand or privately message me and say, wow, um, how do I tell my boss that every time my, one of my kids gets a sniffle, I'm going to lose my child care for 14 days? How do I have that conversation? How do I keep my job? So people are terrified of losing their health insurance, losing their jobs, um, losing their careers that they've worked so hard for because they don't have even access to childcare right now. And so they feel like they are not doing as well at work. And as you can see, 80% or so feel like they're doing badly as caregivers to themselves, which leads us to the next slide. Uh, the self-care dilemma is a pretty big dilemma. And the mom's hierarchy of needs, which I haven't actually shown you, but I'll describe it at the base of the hierarchy. It's a bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Everything that we prioritize and consider you know, mission critical in our lives, which on the mom's hierarchy of needs are things like you know, our children's well-being <laughs> and their milestones and their health and, and their education. And then as you ascend, you know, all of those things that are really critical for our mental, physical, and emotional health healthy relationships with other adults, self-care. And in my world, that is sleep, right? That is not getting a manicure. I mean, maybe it is if you like getting manicures, but um, I haven't in quite some time, as you can probably see. But it's, you know, it's sleep, it's movement, it's stress management, um, it's development and learning and fun and all of those things that kind of fuel you. And as you can see here, even in the most recent wave of the study, and it's been pretty consistent since I started the research, people have abandoned self-care largely because there's about 50 times the amount of laundry and dishes. They are trying to work and school from home in many cases, or if they've had to return to office, they don't have a good child care or elder care situation. So they're struggling to make it all work and there's still more people in the house. So there's a lot more housework, a lot more childcare, a lot more engagement with our kids' schools. If you have school-age kids, as I do, you'll, you'll know there's probably about a thousand emails that you get now versus what used to be maybe 500 emails a week. Um, so all of those things have meant to make it work and to make the time, people are not taking care of themselves. And now that we're over a year in, it, we're seeing it, and I'm seeing it in my data, huge outpouring of cries for mental health care, a huge outpouring of cries for child care, and a huge outpouring of cries for just time, time to themselves, time to decompress, time to do deep work. People who have parenting responsibilities, and even now that I do this research also for employers where I'm studying employee populations that where I'm also running research for non-caregivers. So even for employees who are earlier in their career, they don't have families, um, you know, they're dealing with depression and feeling dislocated and feeling isolated. So people are dealing with a lot emotionally and they're trying to get the work done, even though in every single industry, the how the work gets done and what's strategically important has completely changed. So all of that is feeding into these numbers and the fact that your employees, your colleagues, um, and the teams that you represent, you know, they're really struggling with a lot of cognitive overload while also trying to manage their careers and their relationships at home and their relationships at work. So that's the backdrop. Um, and if we can advance to the next slide. We can... Are you able to? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I shared with you my sad story of burnout and the question that I've received and that I'm continually asked when I meet with leadership teams is, well, what, you know, why won't my parents tell me or my caregivers? Because again, this is also a, a big issue for anyone with senior care responsibilities. Um, you know, child care is is a mess, it always was a mess, and it's a bigger mess now, but elder care is also incredibly constrained. And because the senior population, you know, has been disproportionately affected and at risk for COVID, 
people have had less options. You know, whatever their senior care setup was, it's changed and they've had less options. So this applies there too. But, you know, people don't ask for help um, because, again, in our society, I think we're conditioned to believe in this story of the, you know, the pull yourself up by the bootstraps and power through. Um, it's all of the beautiful things about American independence, but tempered by the downsides of that, right? People are feeling vulnerable. They are not wanting to lose their income. They're not wanting to lose their health care. And they're afraid that if they raise their hands and say they're struggling, that it's going to threaten their, their job security. So people, and these are all verbatims from the study, um, it's, it's a really important time for leaders and for organizations to be proactive about supporting parents, supporting caregivers, supporting work-life balance, and supporting tough conversations about mental health. Um, so we can advance to the next slide. There's a huge psychological safety gap. I won't go into all the details in the interest of time, but you know, there's a lot of really good reasons that people don't ask for help um, because traditionally, particularly mothers, but even parents in general have been penalized um, for taking time off, for taking leave of absences, for kind of exposing caregiving responsibilities. So that like legacy, in the workplace, which still exists, right, is, is part of why people try to kind of hide their caregiving responsibilities and hide what's going on in their lives when they're in the workplace. If we advance to the next slide. And what I think has been really interesting, like work, at least for caregivers, um, I mean, I can speak for mothers, but even for fathers, as I've spent more time now doing research with dads, um, Men who want to be hands-on loving fathers have, um, as you know, also feel that they have many restrictions around how they can engage at home. And mothers, by contrast, are like, we're tied to the household. And it's like a fight to escape those responsibilities. But work never really fit for working parents. It was always hard. Childcare has never been even. And even under the best of circumstances, when someone can afford the childcare that they want, um, it's not 100% reliable. So people are don't want to return to the old normal. Um, despite the loss of work-life separation and how hard that's been, people are loving having more time with their families. They're loving seeing their kids during the day. If they want to take a nap during the day, throw in a load of laundry during the day, you know, so just really consider in the return to office conversations, and if you're doing your own research about what people need, just being aware that at least of the parents in my study, over 2,000 of them, like no one wants to go back to work full time. Um, we can advance the slide, and by back to work, I mean back to the office full time. Uh, people want some sort of a hybrid arrangement or flexibility. In when asked what kind of benefits could be provided to them to support them at work. And I think the good news is that in the beginning of the study, it was less than 20% of parents who believed that their employers were supporting them sufficiently at work or supporting them well. And it's improved, right? It's improved dramatically. Employers have stepped up in incredible ways. But people are still in need of support. As you can see, flexibility, and by flexibility, I mean flexible expectations, I mean, people want that more than they want money, more than they want raises, right? More than they want childcare in some situations. Um, and for those of you who are in public health, which I know is quite a few of you, I've seen consistently that in the healthcare fields, my parents in healthcare are under a lot of strain. Um, so there's there's some extremes here, right? Like people are more interested in paid leave and childcare um, disproportionately in certain fields. But flexible expectations, I'm telling leaders, you know, if you want to be family friendly, like don't have your staff meeting at 8 a.m. Nobody wants to be in a staff meeting at 8 a.m. And if they have kids, they're trying to get their kids set up for school or they're trying to feed them breakfast or they're trying to get things sorted out. Um, you know, people are feeling compelled uh, to respond to every message and every alert. You schedule send, right? No one needs to get an email from you at nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night. Like, Schedule it, have it arrive during business hours. Um, giving people less synchronous time where they're expected to be on, creating windows that are 
meeting free zones. Several of my clients, we've kind of put this in place, like meeting free, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays or meeting free Fridays or let's have meetings between the hours of one and three and the rest of the time is asynchronous time. Like people are hungry for deep work. They don't want to work after their kids are asleep or in the wee hours of the morning, which is what many parents are doing because they're feeling like they're trapped on Zoom all day. So these are just a few things that you can put into practice without spending any money. Um, and then if you can spend money, uh, what I suggest to employers in, at the top of the list when people are asked what do they need for their mental, uh, sorry, for their happiness, well-being, or productivity, mental health care, child care, and flexibility are the three answers for each of those categories. So if you can subsidize, curate, or support mental health care in a different way, you know, help people shortcut the line, they're on long waiting lists to get specialists for mental health care, perhaps provide different access to your EAP. People have said navigating EAPs can be difficult. Some employers are bringing in psychologists or psychiatrists or pairing people with coaches or setting up peer circles. So I think there's lots of ways to get creative around the need, but it's a huge need right now. And then subsidizing or curating access to child care and elder care are the other two. We can advance to the last slide because I think I'm at time. Um, and we can go to the very last slide because I think I got to cover these issues. So questions. I know I had to speed through those last few, but I wanted to kind of share the, the story arc of what's been happening, why it's so relevant. And I think all of you are in incredible positions as leaders and as people who are either in human resources or working in the health field, you know, to usher in these types of supports and changes. Leslie, I don't have a question, but I was looking at the chat and Susan and others say thank you very much for sharing your story and that they can so relate um, in that it was really helpful for you to share that backstory in an honest way. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Again, I feel good now. At the time, it didn't feel good, but I feel like I actually can contribute to help people who are going through burnout in many cases for the first time now. <laughs> That's okay, great. and a couple other questions in the chat. Um, um, Ruth, can I just stop you there just because um, we want to